Hey everybody, it's great to see you today. Welcome to Living Power, your online Bible study where we are walking through the Bible in a year. Today is October 20th and we have some interesting scripture verses to discuss today. Part of what we read is a discussion between the Pharisees and, the G and Jesus when the Pharisees ask him a very direct question. And that question is, what... Or when will the kingdom of God come? And this begins a section in Luke 17, verse 20 to 37, that is very telling, gives us a little bit more details about the second coming, and we're going to get into that. That we'll cover at the end of the lesson today, but there is also this story of Lazarus rising from the dead, and we begin to see the plot to kill Jesus is thickening. So we want to cover all these things today. I'd really like to start with Lazarus first. It was first in the reading. We read John 11, 38 to 44. And it's interesting to see that Jesus has this emotion. He weeps today in the reading, and it says he was angry. He was angry in his spirit. Now, as you read the story, did did you wonder what was he angry about? Was he angry because uh, Mary or Martha, Mary told him that Lazarus was dead? Was it the way she said it? You know, what was it something there? Probably not. Was he just angry that Lazarus had died? Uh, yes, of course, um, but if he knew he could resurrect Lazarus, then what was the need for him being angry about that? Did he mind healing people? Did he mind performing these miracles? No, of course not. The anger that welled up within Jesus' heart at this moment was probably his grief and, and agony and anger over the fact that the earth is on, under a curse and that men and women are tainted with sin. And this is not how the Father God designed creation to be. Before the fall in the garden, where there was paradise and the earth was blossoming and blooming and the animals were at peace with man and man was at peace with them and man was at peace with God, that is what I believe Jesus longs for. The Trinity longs for is that restoration. That restoration and reconciliation with God and the earth turning back to the way it was in the garden will happen. And it's something that we get to look forward to. That's part of what Jesus corrects and what he does in this millennial period, which the second coming, of course, precedes that millennial period. So we see Jesus hates death. He hates suffering. Remember, he came so that we may have joy and live life to the full. God loves to bless. He does not like to curse. Um, and he just hates it that there is a curse on everything at the moment. Jesus doesn't go immediately when he hears, does he? He waits for about four days. Why do you suppose he waited? Well, some people speculate that he waited to make sure um, and prove to everyone that, yes, Lazarus was dead to show to the glory of God that Jesus could raise people from the dead. You know, back then, people certainly medically would have fallen into comas, but did they know, had you know, were they able to diagnose what a coma was? Don't really know for sure. So it could be, I remember reading um, in one study material that said, you know, in ancient history, sometimes people would um, fall into a coma and people thought that they were dead. But when they came out of the coma later, that, um, you know, luckily if they hadn't been buried already, um, it would have appeared to be a resurrection. I don't know for sure, but this could be something like that. We do know that Jesus waited because he wanted this miracle to be for the glory of God and so that many would believe in him. It's ironic, though this story because this event proved that Jesus had power over death, but it really was one of the catalysts that led to his death because this is when the Pharisees really kicked it up a notch in their plot against Jesus. So um, when Jesus says, Lazarus, come out, notice he said his name because Jesus, the name above all names, only has to speak our name and we will be resurrected. 
you and I will be resurrected the same way that Lazarus was resurrected here. So, you know, I've heard it said, and, and I chuckle every time I think about it, in this passage, Jesus had to be very careful to say Lazarus come out instead of just come out. Because if he had said come out, everyone, all the dead in Christ would have been raised at that point. So he had to be very careful to mention Lazarus' name. Um, you know, um, Martha is shown here as the activist that she was. Her greeting when she greets Jesus was such a statement of faith. Uh, Mary um, shows the contemplative personality that she had and that her faith was very sincere but limited in nature. She didn't fully understand, I don't think, uh, everything that Jesus could do. Jesus, however, makes a claim about himself in this story that uh, that is pretty amazing. And I, I think actually um, it may have been it may have been yesterday, but he makes a claim about himself. It's the fifth I am statement, and that is, I am the resurrection and the life. And, of course, he says anyone who wants to go, go to the Father needs to come through me. And um, Jesus, when he reveals things about himself, when God the Father reveals things to humanity over the course of history, it has always produced two types of responses in human beings. Either people come to saving faith in Christ and they believe, or they can hear the same message and stay entrenched in their stubbornness and their rebellion, and they've refused to believe. It's been that way since the beginning of time. It still is that way today in contemporary times. The Pharisees it appears, were unfortunately on the side of humanity that decides to hear the message and stay entrenched in their rebellion. They just wanted absolutely nothing to do with Jesus' message. So the plot to kill Jesus thickens, and uh, we see Caiaphas, the high priest, saying something today that was extremely profound and extremely prophetic, although I don't think he really realized the prophecy that he was speaking. I don't think he understood the full ramifications of what he was saying when he said, it's better for one man to die for the sins of the people rather than all the people dying. And of course, he's speaking about the gospel in its essence. It was the Father's good and perfect plan to send his son, his perfect son who was without sin, the only one who would have qualified to die for the sins of the world. For him to come and die on our behalf so that you didn't have to die and I didn't have to die and our families and our friends and people throughout history didn't have to die. Caiaphas was right, although we wonder if he really knew what he was saying. Now, this passage in Luke, Luke 17, is very interesting because the Pharisees in their dialogue with Jesus today ask him a point-blank question. When will the kingdom of God come? You see, there was heightened expectation at this time. They were looking for the Messiah. Of course, they were looking for a, um, a, a king that would overthrow the current Roman government. They didn't understand the scriptures that had foretold that he had to suffer first and that there would be two comings. They didn't understand that. But Jesus does reply and give them a lot of details about the second coming. And I wanted to point your attention to Luke 7. 17, verse 26. Uh, actually, verse 24, it describes lightning flashing in the sky from one end to the other, so it will be when the Son of Man comes. This gives us insight, and there are many other scriptures that support this, that when Jesus returns at his second coming, it's not going to be you know, blind eye. It's going to be like lightning from the sky. And my understanding is that everyone on the earth, whether you're at the North Pole or the South Pole, is going to be able to see this cataclysmic event, this second coming return of the Lord Jesus. Now, when he comes, he's coming to defend the nation Israel from annihilation at the Battle of Armageddon. But he is also coming to inflict judgment on the nations. You know, we've read in Amos, we've read in different places in the Old Testament about the, the day of the Lord. The great day of the Lord is a time of judgment on Israel and on the disobedient nations. So, you know, Jesus' first coming, he came as a lamb. 
He died and he gave his life for us. The second coming is going to be totally different where he is coming in judgment and there will be death and there will be people separated, the righteous from the unrighteous and there there will be things that will not be very pleasant. Judgment is not pleasant. And when he comes back, he is going to take his throne by force and he will not be defeated that second time. Now here's what I wanted to show you in Luke 17, 26. When the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in Noah's day. Verse 28, and it will be like it was in the days of Lot. And what they're, what he's saying, the scripture writer is saying, is that people are going about their daily business. They're eating, they're drinking, they're getting married. When you get married, you're thinking hopeful thoughts about the future. You're not thinking about getting your life ready for the day of judgment. You're just kind of going about your daily life. This is what is going to happen when Jesus comes again. It will be business as usual, verse 30, right up to the day when everyone sees Jesus Christ. Then it goes on to say, 31, on that day a person on the deck of a roof must not go down into the house. A person out in the field must not go home. Remember what happened to Lot's wife. If you cling to your life, you will lose it. If you let your life go, you will save it. 34, that night two people will be asleep in one bed, one taken, the other left. 35. Two women grinding flour at the mill, one taken, the other left. I did a lot of digging into the meaning of these scriptures, and what I discovered is that there, there is basically two theories of thought, and I want to share both of them with you so that you can, you know, in this study, I like to encourage you to a lifetime of study. I like to show you all the different schools of thought, and I like for you based on your study to come to the conclusion that you will come to. The first the first thinking is that this refers to the rapture, that this is, is, the, is the part where um, Jesus takes his own, his church, out of the world and he raptures them, not to judgment, but he, he raptures them out of this world. The second school of thought, however, is that this is not that rapture, that this is a rapture of actually uh, the wicked. It's, the, um, it's a judgment that Jesus will place on the on individuals not the nations as a whole but on individuals throughout every nation and that it, the taking could be a taking out of the world into judgment so in one um, one school of thought was that they're taken out of the world because they're not fit to enter into the millennial kingdom that will continue here on the earth you know, that's different from the first school of thought that says that these people are taken because they're Christ's um, uh, believers. They're, they're the, the church taken out so that they don't have to endure the day of wrath here on the earth. So there are, there are good, valid points on each of the uh, sides of the equation here. Um, so the point, however, to know is that yes, there will be a judgment when Jesus returns. This could very well be pointing to that judgment. Um, yes, there will be a rapture of the church and those saints, we, we understand that would be our future as believers in Christ. We would not um, suffer a judgment, although we will be judged before the Lord Jesus based on His righteousness, not based on something that we did or didn't do. So ours is the kind of judgment that um, that we would want to hope for and look look forward to. The one thing we can know for sure, the message of this, whether it's this is the rapture of the church or this is a rapture of people to judgment, is this that we are to be prepared and be ready when the Lord returns. You know, a lot of contemporary books talk about being life ready. Well, how about let's live our lives Jesus ready? Are you ready for the Lord to return? If he returned in the next second, would you be ready to lay your life 
bear in front of him? Would you be ready with all of your uh, things in order, um, having lived your life as you knew he would want to, so that you can stand before the Lord Jesus and tell him about the things that you did? Would you be ready for that day? I pray that you would, and I pray that this reading quickens you to think more about that most important meeting when you'll stand before the Lord, and what is it that you'll want to say about your life. Let's all stand together and focus on that moment, being ready for the return of Christ, and let's just live Jesus ready. Well, I pray that this has been a blessing to you. We're going to continue tomorrow. Until then, blessings. Shalom.